Hi everyone and welcome to a overview of the life and paintings of Georgia O'Keeffe. Uh, she is an American artist and she's uh, one of the more famous American artists. You can always uh, tell the wonderful artists because we have stamps of them, uh, if nothing else. Uh, but again, when we look at what, what she's done, uh, she's very interesting because she, she's kind of this uh, area, the, the transition into kind of modern art that American art makes and, and kind of shows the transition from uh, a lot of the European thinking uh, forward. She was born in 1887 in Sun Prairie, Wisconsin. Uh, she lived there with her family and eventually they moved to Williamsburg in 1903. Uh, from 1905 to 1906, she went to the School of the Art Institute of Chicago. In 1907, she studied at the Art Student League in New York. And in 1908, she did win the William Merritt Chase Award, which was an award to grant her a scholarship to of, of summer school to uh, study at Lake George. Uh, New York. <clears throat> From 1908 to 1912, she abandoned fine art uh, for the commercial art practice in Chicago. Uh, from 1912 to 1914, she taught public school in Amarillo, Texas. Uh, and during the summer, she would actually go to the Columbia College in South Carolina and assist there. Uh, from 1916 to 1918, she was head of the art department at West Texas A&M at Palo Duro Canyon. Uh, and this is, is an example of, of the work from around 1916. And again, uh, kind of some of the work that she's doing at this time. You can kind of see the influence of the European masters, uh, but again, the very American kind of version of this. It, already we can see that her work is about two basic concepts, that of color uh, and that of form. And, and in this, you can see, uh, we can identify that these are people, but uh, any any significant attributes are, are kind of lost to the wayside uh, in, re in, in replaced with the idea of just color. 1908, she moves to New York City, uh, and this is when she, she becomes acquainted with Alfred Stieglitz in the 291 Gallery. Uh, as early as April 6, 1916, though, he was showing 10 of her drawings, and from my understanding, she didn't know about this. Uh, she, he essentially got the drawings from a friend of hers. Uh, in 1917, she has her first solo show there. She will continue to have uh, solo exhibitions at the 291 Gallery. Uh, in, in 1918, she meets the Precisionists. Uh, and these are a whole body of work, a whole body or school of thought in, in American art that you can definitely see Georgie O'Keeffe kind of being a, around this school, but not quite there. This uh, A lot of them are, again, simplifying what we think of uh, as objects in, in front of them to, to basic forms and, and creating larger patterns of color. Uh, she, she and Alfred Stieglitz fall in love with each other. Uh, they start living with each other, and eventually uh, he was married at the time. He is eventually granted a divorce, uh, and then within a few months they actually marry uh, uh, each other. Other and uh, will have a relationship for at least the rest of, of his life and and again a very uh, uh, interesting relationship uh, between the two uh, uh, you'll have to kind of look into that for yourself let's get back to, to some of the images here so Apple family number two from 1920 we, we again start to see what we think of as, as kind of O'Keeffe styles of painting uh, end of Barnes from 1922 uh, uh, this and and I believe a few of the other paintings we're going to see are again from uh, the Lake George area of New York. Alfred Stieglitz had a family house up there, so they actually traveled back to this location uh, once again in her life. But when we're looking at this, again, we can kind of see uh, this precisionist quality uh, that, that you would associate with, with her and the other artists from the precisionist school of American art. Uh, again, this kind of simplification. And all of this, uh, again, this is almost borderline cubism. If you look at, at how she's really reducing things down to, to the essential shapes uh, and creating these larger planes of color, uh, again, this is kind of one of the hallmarks that we have with her work that you kind of have from a transition of, of the European modernism, as I mentioned before, uh, leading forward into to American uh, art that we'll see later on. And again, this is really uh, uh, the Lake George, formerly Reflection Seascape. 
this is really kind of when we see uh, what she's doing that's such a magical thing, and that is uh, she's not only reducing the form, she's creating a sense of harmony uh, within the canvas itself, uh, within the forms, and it, it, it's not just the reduction, but it's uh, creating within the space of the canvas and using the, the, the total surface of the canvas, even though with a lot of her work we feel like we're, we're extending beyond it. My shanty, Lake George, is a great example of that, that cubist influence I was talking about. If you look and how the front of the barn is, is parallel in some ways to the side of the barn, everything's kind of been brought to the foreground, uh, including the doors to the barn. You can see there's two sides to it, but again, they've just kind of flat rectangles uh, in relationship to the surface of the canvas and the roof has just become a, a trapezoid. Uh, at the same time, uh, it, it's it's around this time that we start to see her uh, looking at more organic forms and, and uh, I always think of the leaves, uh, especially purple leaves from 1922 as kind of being a predecessor of a lot of the paintings that she does do uh, with flowers when she is living in New York. And again, if you've ever been to uh, this part of the world, uh, during uh, autumn it really is beautiful because there is this whole range of colors and so in some ways when we're looking at what she's doing with these leaves uh, again this is kind of a predecessor and at least in my mind for uh, what we see kind of continuing onward uh, changing and finding a subject matter but not only finding that subject matter you'll notice how close we are uh, to these leaves she's finding one small aspect of existence and, and really focusing down on that uh, to show the many many variations that you can kind of see uh, by being so close to this object and where there are leaves there are there are of course trees and this is just an interesting comparison autumn trees and chestnut tree the maple uh, uh, when we look at on the right uh, again almost moving to this cubist sense and on the left really uh, moving towards this more precisionist sense of of really just making the form be what's there and, and really having the solid form uh, within the canvas and each individual object is really uh, very very you know, uh, firm. Um, 1924 and 19, uh, we also see some of the first paintings that she does of flowers, Light of the Iris, and, and these are wonderful because of the lightness uh, that she has in this, and I, this is something that I'm always amazed with, uh, with, with Miss O'Keefe's paintings, is her use of white and, and how uh, unintimidated she is to, to leave so much of the canvas uh, open and, and let it breathe, so to speak. When we look at things like Petunia uh, Number 2 from 1924, uh, the application of color is is really uh, very very small in comparison to to uh, other painters. There's it, it's very very just subtle, but that subtlety is is almost like a breath of of fresh air. You don't find this this hecticness uh, within her paintings. That they're very very calming and and very very easy uh, for that reason. What I've kind of done with a lot of these is arranged uh, multiple flower paintings together so that we can have kind of a comparison. And again, this is one of the nice things that we do uh, realize about her work is that there is a, a huge amount of variation in how she actually is painting uh, the flowers themselves. And, and uh, again, as I mentioned before, uh, the, the wonderful thing about this is she uses uh, the majority of the canvas. And, and not only that, you, you feel like uh, the, the, the flowers or whatever the subject matter that you're looking at, in this case uh, black and purple petunias, just continues to move off uh, of, of the canvas and, and just continues off into infinity even though you're only looking at a very small little snapshot. This is a great example if you look on the left and you see just that little piece in the corner there. Uh, uh, again, that's just the small aspect of the flower and it, it almost leaves it to our imagination to fill in the rest the Canis series, this bright, bright, vibrant red, and again, a wonderful comparison between these two, and, and uh, just kind of exploring what she actually is doing in terms of variation of the subject matter. I mean, it, it, it's she's very renowned for just painting uh, flowers in this very, very close-up fashion, but when you look at what she's actually doing, there's a huge amount of variation in how she's actually painting uh, the flowers themselves. And although she is 
<clears throat> famous for her flower painting. Some of the other paintings she did in New York, especially of New York from this period, uh, are, are very interesting. It's this perspective of looking up and, and it's so fascinating to me how she actually uses the building structures uh, to, to kind of create almost this window where the you, you, you see the sky, but the sky is, is kind of dwarfed underneath these huge constructions. And again, if you've ever been in one of the larger cities, and looked up and uh, when you're in the downtown area you kind of do get this experience uh, the, the New York radiator building from 1927 is one of her more famous paintings and, and very again the simplification and, and uh, the forms themselves really do become kind of flattened out it doesn't really it's almost like you're removing the sense of depth and, and letting the viewer uh, apply that kind of concept uh, for themselves Oriental Poppies from 1928. Uh, again, this is when we, she really does start to become more more renowned for the flower paintings that she's first doing in New York. And uh, as I mentioned earlier, uh, Alfred Stieglitz has has the gallery uh, 291, and he does have, uh, I believe, an annual show for her. So she does have some fame even early early on uh, uh, with her work, uh, especially with with the subject matter. And again. Uh, here's a, a huge amount of variation between these two images, but again, uh, just to, to kind of highlight what she can actually do in terms of these flowers. This one I love because if you look in the center, uh, you have this bulb of, of light and it almost looks like a street lamp and you're somehow looking through these flowers out into uh, uh, the street uh, of, of New York City. This one has kind of almost a posterized effect. It's almost borderline pop art uh, in a sense. And uh, again, we're still pretty far from that. Uh, just some more of these images of, of flowers, which of course is her, her main staple of work while she's living in New York City. Uh, again, when we look at this though, we can kind of see that the, the, the objects themselves are changing when she's, uh, when we look at the black hollyhocks, uh, black hollyhocks, excuse me, the blue lake spur, uh, they're becoming more of forms rather than these intricate little parts. And, and again, uh, by blowing them up to this extreme, Jack in the Pulpit number four from 1930s, another example of this. Uh, it's really pushing the object even away from being a flower uh, and into being something else. Again, this is almost uh, becoming this collection of objects where uh, if you if you remove the title uh, and and you just uh, uh, and you didn't know anything about the artist and you just looked at this, one would even have trouble necessarily approaching this as being a flower, uh, but. In 1929, she travels to Taos, New Mexico, and uh, for the next 20 years or so, she kind of moves back and forth and spends at least part of her time in New Mexico. She first visits the area uh, that we think of as or call Ghost Ranch in 1934 and, and moves there in 1940. Uh, her husband, Alfred Stieglitz, dies in 1946, uh, and she actually gets another house in Abaco, uh, New Mexico around 1945. Uh, these are some of the images of, of her home uh, there in New Mexico and you can kind of see uh, it's it's very very rural uh, by contemporary standards but there's there's uh, this energy or, or, or feeling uh, there that I think is is, is kind of very much fitting uh, Georgia O'Keeffe and again uh, she was in the Amarillo area of Texas the Palo Duro and, and that it's not really incredibly that far off from uh, the terrain that you'll see here. This is inside her house and, and inside of her studio. And again, you can kind of see uh, the ceiling is made of these wonderful timber beams. All of this you can actually go in and visit uh, the whole Ghost Ranch area. There's a uh, museum uh, for her in Santa Fe that gives a wonderful series of tours of the area and, and actually shows uh, where she's working. But this really kind of it uh, marks the second uh, kind of transitional point uh, where she starts using different objects that she would find. The horse skull. Uh, this is where we first start seeing the image of the skull in abundance uh, in connection with her work. And, and we also see the skull paired uh, with flowers, uh, cow skull with calico roses from 1931. Uh, I've, I've always kind of just seen this as a simple uh, symbol of life and death together. And, and again, this kind of comparison uh, of the organic forms that, that we have 
between the the natural occurring skull and and the flowers uh ranchos church new mexico again a very simplification down of the forms and uh as i mentioned when when, when we when we see her work from new mexico this is really we, we we do see kind of this uh this this other aspect kind of working in and that is uh landscapes again we have a few paintings of new york uh but here in new mexico it becomes a a major staple of her work